This video will provide a brief introduction to cognitivism. So we will be discussing what cognitivism is. We are going to be looking at how it compares to behaviorism, how it explains learning in regards to memory, um, stages of the cognitive development, as well as metacognition. So cognitivism is, uh, was established as a challenge or shift from behaviorism. Cognitivism approaches learning from a different light than behaviorism. It focuses on internal thoughts and processes. These can include learning or memory. Um, it refers to mental processes including um, memory, emotions, attention, language, neural processing, etc. It was developed to explain how learning can occur based on thoughts rather than strictly behaviors. So it allows for a deeper understanding of why and how we are able to think and learn. Like behaviorism, it uses a scientific method to approach learning theories. It does not really rely on introspection to look at thoughts. So again, it uh, takes it from more of a scientific approach than something like introspection does, which we talked about in the last video as well. So it looks at the thoughts rather than strictly behaviors. It looks at the information processing model and it is tied closely to constructivism. So the next video will um, share some of the same information. But for now, we will look at the relationships between cognitivism and behaviorism. So where behaviorism focuses on external behaviors and responses to stimulus, cognitivism focuses on internal thoughts and processes. Cognitivism approaches the mind in an information processing model where the brain acts as a CPU in regards to how it handles processes, stories, memory, um, and how quickly it processes information. It leads to the notion that the brain could be replicated through computers, um, and if you've ever watched Jeopardy, you have seen that with Watson. So it developed uh, development of the thought process rather than behaviors, and it discusses what we're thinking at at a given moment. So when we look at memory and learning, um, the study of memory is very theoretical in nature and there are a few different theories on how it occurs. The three-stage memory model is the most well-known and it fits into the information processing model well. The first stage is sensory memory, which is where the information is um, attended to and picked up by the sense organs. It is important to note that you must attend to the information you want to successfully store in your memory. If the information was successfully put in your sensory memory, which can only be held for a few seconds, it can be uh, then transferred to your short-term memory. Short-term memory is able to hold the information for about 25 seconds and can really only hold five to nine items unless you use rehearsal or other techniques like chunking information. If you rehearse this information or encode it successfully, it moves into your long-term memory where it should stay for the rest of your life. Some memories may fade and others can take a while to bring to mind, while others are exceptionally easy to recall. From here, we're actually going to look at how cognitive development occurs. So, uh, Piaget was uh, a strong advocate of cognitive learning, and he created a stage model of cognitive development to explain the differences between children's minds um, through their growth. So as a child's cognitive development grows, so does their ability to understand rational thought as well as abstract thinking. So we're going to start by looking at the sensory motor stage, which is from birth to two years. Children are egocentric. Uh, they do not have conservation. They explore with their senses. Um, this is why you see a lot of children um, putting things in their mouth to explore. And they can't uh, see it if it's gone. Um, they don't have a sense of conservation if you have parents that leave the room, they get very upset because they think they're gone. Um, Peekaboo is a good example of that. They think that as soon as something leaves their vision, um, it's disappeared. So when we talk about children being egocentric, we're not referring to the fact that they think they are in the center of the universe. In the universe, they aren't able to understand other people's thoughts or ideas. Um, they're only aware of what they can see or what they are thinking. So the next stage uh, is the pre-operational stage. 
and this is from two to six years old. They have no conservation of mass, volume, etc. So you might want to look up um, videos of a glass water test or a conservation test. And what you can see is that children aren't able to see how um, moving two items can continuously keep it the same conservation. Or if you were to show a child a um, small, wider glass and a tall, skinnier glass and poured the same volume of liquid into both glasses, the child would think that the tall, skinny glass has more in it because it's at a higher level than the small, wider glass. So they're not able to have that conservation of mass or volume. They cannot see others' perspectives um, they're not able to look at situations from another's um, viewpoint or see what they could be seeing. So at the concrete operational stage, this happens from 6 to 11, children are able to see from alternate perspectives. Um, the conservation of state occurs as well. They're able to understand that if you have 10 pennies it's equal to a dime or if you are able to look at that um, those two glasses they have the same amount of liquid in them if you were to show a child um, this image here the child would be able to identify what they're seeing from their viewpoint so they are going to see one big mountain but the clown's viewpoint is going to see three peaks because they're viewing it from a different angle However, they are not able to think abstractly. That occurs in the formal operational stage, and this is from age 11 plus. And they're able to reason and problem solve. They can make arguments, they can engage in abstract thought and reflection, and they can develop these skills further um, as well if they have reflection. So this is where metacognition comes in. Um, so metacognition is studying how cognitions occur. Metacognition is present in reflection, thinking, and analyzing one's own or other's thoughts. Reflection actually allows for a tremendous amount of growth if you are able to analyze your own thoughts and actions. It can create cognitive dissonance, however, and cognitive dissonance occurs when you're holding two opposing views in one's mind simultaneously. Um, and this is how we can grow relating to constructivism, which we're going to talk about next week. But if you hold two thoughts in your mind that are opposing, you're going to have to do some rethinking and reevaluating of the situation. And through that, you're going to experience growth. So again, there's a strong tie to cognitive, or sorry, constructivism. So we're going to be branching into that a lot um, in the next video. But some questions to consider for this um, theory is how does or cognitivism explain the role of behaviorism in our lives, especially when unwanted conditioning occurs? Can we approach learning from both perspectives? How does this relate to cognitive behavioral therapy, um, which is used often in treatment? And can the mind really be compared to a CPU? So I'll leave those with you and we will chat about them in the discussion.